Hammer and Cycle Messenger Service. Hank Greenway wanted his notebook to explain why he was alone past midnight outside Moscow, August 20, 1991, starting the second day of the three-day Soviet coup. This attic is too dark to write in, so because I'm using large print, if I run out of paper, I'll finish on the yellow plastic lining of my black professional messenger bag. Confined inside here isn't like a regular home's comfort from the elements. Pressed against the storm thrashed birch and pine forests surrounding this estate, the intensity of the lightning and thunder permeating through me is merely mellow in contrast to facing how imprudent it was to come here. But I had to try. If what I came to do worked out as great and glorious as the Russian Revolution once purported itself, our company would have replanted the egalitarian hammer and sickle symbol through the misplaced ideal of capitalism from the bottom up. Our messenger service would have rethread the vision on economic principles, so to speak. If trickle down wasn't dammed up and I wasn't just meant to hide here from the vanguard of the proletariat, Sri Lanka. It is the Colonel's game. But I can also trace how my life's chain of events are at fault. I learned exactly what I wanted from my university education. Long before the Soviet crossroads entrapment, I was all muddled and tied together a grown-up American, where privilege is lovingly provided by parents who usually just wish they implied what degree of success their children satisfied them. Why it occurs to me now that I was similarly led into this predicament by the same ideals taken seriously by the vociferously attacked generation just before mine. So it was, in 1964, at age 7, I looked up communism in the encyclopedia and raised the subject at our dinner table. Seeking my parents' counsel was natural since my maternal grandparents who adopted me were born in the 19th century. To me, they lived through centuries of change, compressed into modern times. <clears throat> Though my parents were only a mid-level telephone monopoly supervisor and substitute teacher retirees, I considered them at least equal to the above average humanitarian or politician. My father sat left from me at the head of our dining room table while I wanted to wait for my mother to sit across from me because she just brought in mashed potatoes. But he said no. I told her I had something to ask him. And though shaken by losing control of the stage, I didn't timidly ask. I spoke out that I couldn't see much wrong with the communist ideal of from each according to their ability and to each according to their need. Then, ever since my mother said, Malcolm, you'd better tell him, her darkened eyes' fear symbolized for me the painful scattered logic of our country's red scare. Funny the man I respect more than any other stamped me with these sloganeering gems. Would you want a government telling you what to do, decide what you learn, choose where you live and who you become? My father made sense and I followed the logic. By the late 1970s when I studied, the class war riddle was essentially solved. The Cold War's adversarial slogans fairly naked with Dr. Strangelove on local American television. My concern made me a joke, even to myself. Except, right? Everyone's upset about bombs, but that's other people's business. Spies and whatnot. For decades, it didn't matter how strategic detente was described. Daily life disregarded politics as something to remain innocent from. And the rub is I tried. I was just here on business when 19 hours ago, nostalgic Bolsheviks decided to preserve the dissolved Soviet Union. A serious preservation situation I should have had no business being near. Sincerely. I never wanted to involve myself in other people's business. Having a problem tagging along, I always found alliances awkward. And, as far as politics went, scapegoating the bourgeoisie capitalism or led by the whims of a nation-state communism were ridiculous. But, near the end of my student career, economic responsibilities tug was from my identification with the exploited backbone, the workers.
I decided to read books between moving boxes, so I unambitiously worked a series of warehouse failures, jobs that demonstrated I wasn't content following or led, which is, more or less, when I discovered the bicycle alternative, a dead-end job if there ever was one. You could still be ambitious, but not generally believe possible bike messengering. Family and friends surprisingly already knew there were no benefits plus accidents, but I loved being outside on my own, exercising and identifying with hating drudgery's repetition, hauling this, that, and everything, here, there, and everywhere, again and again and back again. That was my laborer's life in Manhattan, where the efficient street grid packs motor vehicles to capacity with bikes flowing fluidly through. People ask what it's like gliding through, anticipating traffic where you're either instinctual, too slow, or late. The job is in a hurry. Everyone's complete attention is impossible among the masters of the asphalt's petty competition for space best simply waited for. If, wait if waiting weren't New York's most inconvenient experience of all. But in a hurry is a trap. I couldn't stand another second, even to use their most important of all utensils, a free phone. Gone in West 57th's direction after the conveniently efficient New York Times mailroom, unlocking from the no parking sign by the mysterious Crater Hotel's creepy first floor lounge that, that I'd unlocked near, wondering during which era the dive was okay for employees to spend time in. Except I didn't get that far because Times Square's Wide Avenue's invitation to freeway speed provided someone's overconfidence an arrogant boost. Generally, I'm prepared for egos, but this time, beside the old triangular Times building between crisscross Broadway and 7th, a lone racing car ran 7th Avenue's red light in yellow's memory. My immediate swerve to stretch stopping distance caught my back wheel on and anticipating the light, aggressive limo's front fender, sending me over the handlebars at the offender's car. It happened so fast my instinctively outstretched hands caught nothing and felt ripped away just before my left shoulder dislocated, smacking against the car that kept going. No one was too upset. The NASCAR wannabe left the scene of a crime. I was told a courier talked to me in the ambulance when she took my packages. But any... But groaning, I discovered the kind face and relief from an inquisitive nurse. She brought me around, ah, awake. Don't worry, you're taken care of, meaning everything was all right. But this is where my karma twists as a paid bill as opposed to cheaper rates hospitals have less room for. I woke to much too expensive and a name that rang a bell loud enough to hurt a lot. I sounded bitter because I was. I said, you're kidding. Arm and Hammer's limousine? Despite me, her expression strained my interest as much as she could get it to go. She hadn't come of age with me in the 1970s, studying Russia's evolution into the Soviet menace. It's natural she had less clues than I had, such as his having only recently admitted his father named him Arm and Hammer after the Arm and Hammer symbol of the Socialist Party. I knew he used detente to self-promote his American capitalist patriot role of Soviet friend who, whenever he could, made the right phone calls in their language. For instance, helping to get U.S. News and World Reports Nicholas Daniloff out of Soviet jail in 1986. I told the nurse resolutely, I'm not a byline, nothing to gain meeting me. However, he's concerned. You should be grateful he's done what you can't for yourself. I wasn't a patsy for Hammer's charity. She snickered. Yes, yeah, sent home. Workman's comp can't pay close to the attention you've received. But so clearly visible in the disagreeable light, my gratitude became boundless. I boasted, I'm so lucky to have aspired to this tragedy. Cynical. He didn't hit you. Then she sympathetically nodded toward my pillow with a professional scowl and said, Just relax. The bed has restorative power. Many figure out their accidents during their dreams here. She said, But let me tell you before you remember, 
Every day we see the results of messengers taking chances with everyone's life. I knew better than to feel offended and defending myself with a circuitous logic of sorts. The Paul Harvey's radio show, the rest of the story, emphasizes how the full truth requires more information. I don't think it's messenger's fault every day. She huffed. Who's Paul Harvey? So since she asked, the name of Paul Harvey's radio broadcast, the rest of the story, highlights how necessary more information is. And when I mention Paul Harvey, I always credit the mayor of my small hometown who listened every day. That got a smirk from her too. I'll tell your doctor. He needs to know your brain is a circus of muck with ideas. Truth is, you're lucky. Your surgeon said Dr. Hammer was so close he could feel you hit that car hard. From behind tinted windows, I asked her. She said, Dr. Hammer paid attention when he didn't have to care. She advised me to call him Dr. Hammer. You'll get along. So I repeated, please, genuinely wanting Armand Hammer's most recent autobiography. He's practiced on a few before, I said, but I want his last, the blue book. Wanting to appear guileless, Dr. Hammer explains that when alcohol prohibition began, he discovered leaps in sales in the American South because customers were squeezing alcohol from his medicinal tincture of ginger product. He says he went in 1919 to Virginia himself to find out why that item spiked. We're in a pharmacy's back room. The druggist prepared a ginger ale cocktail for him. In true capitalist fashion, he made a million dollars by cornering the world's ginger market before the government stopped his exploitation of the process a year later. Not bad for a 22-year-old in 1920 when a million was worth a million. Of course, course yeah. Hammer doesn't mention blindness or other maladies like death caused by alternative abuse during America's great ignoring of prohibition. A man of his times, he actually brags his Greenwich Village carriage house parties had the good stuff. Rather than observing Hammer's back padding depiction with a grain of salt, some suggest he swam in a skeleton sea that goes something like this for me. The father started from the ground up on an assembly line in Connecticut giving Armand a leg up so Dr. Hammer could paint his grand adventure as wonderfully profound. While not betraying his parents' socialist vision, he was realistic to what the future of capitalism would bring. Truth is, American citizenship gave him the world. Dr. Hammer wrote that in 1921, after Columbia Medical School altruistically bought an ambulance full of medical supplies to ship along with himself to the young Soviet Union. He mentions the trip was to also collect debts the Soviets owed his family's export company, but implies that the pyramid's top, Lenin, only noticed him in a report about a railway cleared of peasants so Hammer's goods could get through to his asbestos mining operation. Armand revealingly admits he refused to pay a bribe, so the station master who'd held up the train was shot on his behalf, ordered killed by a better fed commissar, enforcing the rules on the station master who was just as uselessly resentful as everyone else. One of many cited instances where all his life Hammer scratched his itch to use powerful people. So Dr. Hammer receives an audience with the man his father already knew, but the debt isn't brought up as beneath the integrity of the communist vision. That's Hammer's story to redeem his patron Lenin's revolutionary new economic policy that Stalin destroyed. What Hammer wants the reader seeing is his innocent connection between business and politics. In the middle, as he was, is still the middle. Hammer and historians credit his conversations and correspondence with Vladimir Ilyich Yulianov that spurred the doctor's further venture among the few independent capitalists called concessionaires. There was an American Harriman and Germans did business, but Soviet citizens were reduced to shared servitude. Historians even assume Stalin knew pervasive commerce had advantages 
but the simple dictatorship of the proletariat was easier for the paranoid to control. But under Lenin's umbrella in the bullish 20s, Hammer was also focused on zenith proportions and monopoly for himself. He didn't assemble Ford tractors, but insisted that only he should broker them. He admits these things of a very cozy politically economic connection. You think communism was corrupted? Essentially, the revolution was always connected guys running a capitalism for some with Stalin's slow salary affront for living like a king. President Gorbachev is fond of what Lenin's net plan was supposed to have tried adapting capitalist realities to socialist principle. With everyone else in the country, Mikhail Gorbachev remembers growing up with pencils stamped hammer from Oman's factory. If life were squeaky clean, his heroic claims could be acceptably polished. Because I read a flaw, Hammer says he stayed away from Stalin until 1930 when he lost his mansion and businesses toward the end when he had to leave town. Then his biography smooths over his decades as an American capitalist when he had to have been a stooge as demonstrated by the evidence he got out of Moscow alive. I don't care. Whatever Dr. Hammer was, as his father's son, he was in the middle. A miracle, along with his family, allowed to leave with profit from Russian artwork sold during the 1930s in department stores across America as compensation for his business's absorption, Dr. Hammer writes. The cover story backs up the intrigue, intriguingly, of communism's Mickey Mouse off to his next capitalist escapade. At 7.20, I asked Chain to look for Rodney. You guys in symbolism, you're not Greek myths. I found out Bike Messenger's sacrifice had a champion. Over a century ago, a great man explained our vacation's meaning as part of a great coming age. Heard of Dostoevsky? His name has a lyricism all its own, doesn't it? Dostoevsky. Because from Dostoevsky's 19th century vantage and his book, Notes from Underground, I read Fyodor's prediction the future perfect world would include those who risk personal injury just to prove they're the individual in charge of our own lives. All this risk the modern world takes is evidence this is already the future utopia Dostoevsky predicts. Rodney spoke for the masses. You're delusional, Greenway. The world is messed up. You need a beer. There, my memory of the party fades in awe of Dostoevsky. Except by coming to visit, Hammer was sacrificing his, his comfortably remote back seat, where lawyers usually preclude facing the moral price of regret. I welcomed this visit, feeling the bicycle's entitlement to the same space every mobile throne feels entitled to charge through. Road encroachment is just stealing in the aristocratic tradition. Finance hedges out less finance. Why wouldn't Hammer's vehicle intimidate someone smaller? His bumper was at my wheel, and for what other reason than arrogance was Hammer's limousine so close? How the hell was I catching a fender and flying into any freaking car? Greeting from the door, his advanced age softened my attitude. I thought about my father with our lawnmower with the electric cord. How he'd advocated to the seven-year-old that electricity without the inconvenient cord could have polluted less. He led me in the conversation to think up the idea of batteries lightning in a box. And my father actually mentioned the Stanley steamer and how in the beginning cars could have gone either way. I remember his look of wonder, how much a child can understand, having only a year or so earlier earned my first penny. Finally engaged with Dr. Hammer's small talk, I heard the end of his asking if I'd been a messenger long. Felt my side concession too long, it reeked of weakness. So with really little said between us, he'd taken my status into account. Looking successfully down his lifted nose, labeling me foolishness to be gotten out of the way. Seriously, he sniffed at his watch and said, at least you know, and asked if I minded if he used the phone. Sure, call the car. But that wasn't enough for me. I added, you're comfortable attached to the phone, aren't you? 
and I haven't spent a dime of your money on it all day, popped out. His shaken head gave notice there'd be no more thinking than necessary about careerless schmucks. I said to his dissatisfied face, set a busy example. Satisfied, my jargon finished me off. Hammer said, right, young man, and lost track of what his watch just said. And he said, I understand your bit. Said, Doctor, I'm aware of my situation. My impudence was thick. Who'd have ever thought powerful Dr. Armand Hammer ever fidgeted in his seat? But Hammer's shell could withstand this. His conspicuous blink shielded feelings the way poker players keep their hands close, meaning dangerous to assume competitors are friendly. I sensed nice was needed because Hammer ate people like me for lunch. And I should be kicked out. I can't defend actions, but words are all the time. People hide behind them. Words are our shields. What could I say that would mean anything when you're already well defended by mere words? Then, our silences were insulting. I pushed. You survived an absurd past. I don't really care. He shook his head. I said, I'm serious, you followed opportunity, and life is ruthless, and capitalism's merit is wonderful. Economics is reality, the unlucky aren't fast enough to get far enough away from their devalued expendability. The under and overworked and ill-educated hear all about maturity before, during, and after it's too late. Economic acquisition is a tough sport where if you're not established as a teenager, your major league career is over. But never out of the economic minor leagues shouldn't destroy people. Hammer said, yes, young man, competition is hard, but you know it's never too late. I must have known because I said, we've all met exceptions, but how many really remind us of ghetto-born truants? Our exceptions don't make us great. The opportunity for everyone would. Hammer's face twisted meaning he dealt with my kind, abusing his time before. In fact, I'm sure having his ethics question was second skin to him, the way his hand reached out for my patience to allow him to speak, then stepped to the door nodding he was going out. So he tried to stiff arm me, which wasn't so necessary but my cue to shut the door and lure him back. He said, I just tried to help. Now you involve me in your derangements? I said, hearing me out will cause you less difficulties than if you leave. I said, the aggressive traffic system allows accidents to happen. Our culture was naturally seduced by the car. Our mistake wasn't an accident. It was a statistically acceptable tragedy. Our college entrance exam is not America's most important SAT test. Our most important is the fudge result that any amount of tragedy is satisfactory. Societal Russian roulette. Spin the cartridge. Hit the gas. Figures show not enough die to dispense with this collision nonsense. Handling me conventionally, Hammer said, what has this to do with me? I said, a cog fueling the vast conspiracy that avoided logical space management by utilizing the train at moderate rates. Your error's mistake was making the train inconvenient, replacing the train industry robber barons with personal car hoods, exploiting convenience disabled our nation with traffic. Look at how the hub Detroit was blindly never in the transportation business, overdosing the entire country on fumes. Profit potential superseded potential profit. Scavenging resources gives us the business. Watch, doctor. The bicycling Chinese have begun duplicating our prosperity. It will be Shakespeare's omen that we can't see the forest for the trees, translated as where's the parking lot for all the cars. Hammer said, you don't know what you're talking about, mocking me or the past. History is not a cardboard cutout. I let my answer be a question. Conglomerates don't contest the earth's spoils? So Hammer said, I see, poor bike messenger. You resent my company Occidental's substantial size, but they are bigger. I think you chose to be a victim. No one told you to bike message. Ha! I read your autobiography, how Occidental Petroleum fell in your lap by accident and marriage. You're not joshing me. 
luck is made. But really, I have no gripe with you. Worked your whole life. Weren't lazy. Was almost a doctor. I am a doctor. You admit in print you never practiced. But don't belittle the Occidental Petroleum man you are. The more consumed, the better entrepreneur. And still, I care less. You have nothing to be entirely ashamed of. Your ghosts are as ridiculous as everyone else's. Every success requires degrees of ruthlessness that... And Hammer slammed his foot. Ashamed? I made my way. You wasted opportunity. Have you tried? Yes, sir. Wasted what I didn't want. Maybe my pursuit of less is misplaced, but less better was never in your way. Why do you resent I'm just a bike messenger? Oh, he said, I understand. You were swayed by outdated philosophy. I snapped back. I adhere to none. Ah, but if anyone knows what passed for truth and wasn't, you might. So tell me, some advertised myth wrapped in convenient truth from the great propaganda war. You know, something like cigarettes satisfy but don't kill you right away. Or to purge society of its lackluster. Stalin developed Soviet industry by clearing out the talent so the mediocre could thrive. He said, I could say, huh, Mr. Greenway, but I know what you mean. Public relations are a necessary device for a corporation. You have to defend yourself from competition. Now, what are you framing me for? I said, ha, doctor, your money's yours. Your problem is your ilk profits from inflation's rise that squeezes less economy for the truly poor portion to participate in. Hammer said, your problem is big business. I said, no, that's your money. The problem is calculating for inflation that contributes to profit destroying full access. That same little bit of money becoming worth less every day affects the poor more than it ever has you. Huh? Huh? Yes, young man, huh? huh is what one says to someone completely off the wall. You criticize but make some money. That's how your world changes. Cast off with a cliché, doctor. I repeat. There's enough money, but even financial reasons are excuses when solutions are ignored for other satisfactions. For instance, keeping up with or ahead and not bothering to solve inflation. And he grinned at the floor, aware he couldn't be prosecuted as responsible. Then amused and satisfied, he said, Young man, economics works. I said, it can in fact fall all over itself. And I'm not saying the problem is all the hands in the till, Dr. Hammer, because I'm trying to put across that I'm for more the merrier. I just want the results the Hippocratic Oath promises. I think medical professionals should be the rich. The medical industrial complex is too complex if we can't calculate affordable cost. The horror is in the figures running through everyone's head that have no relation to the quality their mind should be around. What's irritating is everyone needing this kind of help can't get it. Too expensive to care doesn't make sense. The myth of distribution is bullshit. Hammer said, there you are, young man. The old dying issue solved by private enterprises, legitimate pursuit of profit. I'm afraid I have to go. I said, I'm afraid too. Egging him on still, I said, Good riddance, Dr. Hammer, because I can't candy coat certain things. You meant well meeting me, but your ulterior motives reek. Looking at his autobiography lying on the night table, he said, I understand. My family believed in socialism, and I lived the American dream. I said, I read how your family pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. But you want to know what stuck with me? He said, I don't care. And because I jumped to the floor, he couldn't open the door since I promised to yell all the way to, to his car. But believe me, I'm glad you're staying to hear what caught my attention in your book. This is worth any amount of money you might have wanted to lay on me. Seriously, I wouldn't touch your money. I'd rather make my own. Taunted. 
He scowled with a noise to tell me I hadn't earned his valuable time. But he kept his head start at the door. You confided in your mother's early days she was as devoted to socialism as Rosa Luxemburg herself. So noting her devotion, my imagination conjured elements of meaning together, and I think I saw something that happened one day in her kitchen when your pride was gushing after making your first million. Fine, enough. Many things have been made up about me. Why I set the record straight in the book. His mother had touched a vein, so I poked. Remember when you three teenage hammer kids were sent away in your teens when you lived with separate families of socialist comrades? But from those years lived elsewhere, I felt an ambivalence toward her, and that's when I saw this moment in her kitchen that you must regret. Hammer said, don't get personal, but I will clarify what is picked at in my family history. I was home when my father funded the American Communist Party. His left socialist faction voted to become communists, and my father just tried doing the right thing. There were public revelations I suppose you're too young to know, but decades ago, famous former communists were quoted saying my father was an ambitious outsider in commercial society when Jews weren't allowed to be members of the WASP clubs. My father was gregarious. We saw eye to eye in ways my mother and I never could. But don't mock her. Yes, sir. But however close you weren't, that particular boasting that afternoon, right after you were officially rich in your mother's kitchen, she appreciated your family's advantages through her real memories of people with nothing. But with that million in your pocket, you were feeding off your jazz age pride. Young Armand's chest must have been puffed out of this world. Your father did more than leave you in charge while he was up the river in Austin State Prison. He made you king of the Hammer family fortune. So you arrogantly laughed at what your mother thought you should share. Even then you had to be a dynasty. But that disillusioning day after trying to slap you, she cried over her kitchen sink. Yes, it was only money, and now a lot more. But you were accustomed to only comforting yourself. You must have just stood there. Everyone gets caught up in their success. And you asserted yours, laughing at your mother and making her cry. Your claim of benevolence is convenient. You were hard, and why not? You knew business ethics is conquer or be conquered. I think before you decided to exploit a magnanimous gesture with that ambulance to the Soviet Union, collecting debts for your father, your laughter made your mother's crying extremely hard on her in her kitchen. While you couldn't help laughing because no one person can change anything, but mothers care. She personally felt suffering you might have read about. While you, with your paved American future of ever-blossoming opportunity, were distanced from humility. So what if you knew early that the communist dream was impossible? But you haven't, as claimed, brought nation-states closer, except to negotiate a better rate for your international phone calls. I may as well say it. It was after Stalin's Bolsheviks killed netmen for having wealth again that you traveled out of town first class, on top, same as in your mother's kitchen, just a back-scratcher who made your mother cry. He wanted to berate me, but he hadn't heard much more than his provoked mother's memory. His eyes were slits, facing me down with every membrane of pride to let me have it for my gall. But he couldn't see me. The kitchen anecdote dredged up a piece of conscience that, however true, made his mother loom like cataracts across his pupils in a distant stare, strapped in his time machine chair where I left him, and he thought he'd escaped countless times left in that lonely room with his hindsight of streaming tears. I was glad Hammer's memory afforded him the privacy to suffer alone, that pain we all endure when we can't speak with who we want to hear from most. It's uncomfortable facing myself too, but it must be done, and stared out the window unaware of First Avenue's potential view, looking for peace inside. Then, believe it or not, my eyes reopened on somewhere distant, and the avenue's endless stream of glittering brake lights seemed to soothe my mesmerized eyes in a comfortable trance. 
my fuming subsided into remorse. Then, from just his defeated glare at the floor, suddenly an idea sparked, like fireflies swarming inside my head. I stepped in the room and said, Dr. Hammer, your mother would appreciate an altruistic gesture. Hammer's head popped up as if he'd been faking. He rose, saying, I waited to tell you you're repulsive, and he even mindlessly swung at my injury because I blocked the door. He was in my face, so I said, you're too rich to even fake being sad. I said, mothers aren't gotten over. He said, young man, I told him to stop laying that old man crap on me. He reached for the door. I said, our mothers would appreciate this. He said, you can't aggravate me anymore. I was dismissed. Accept my euphoric insult. We'll start a business that doesn't just dig giant holes. Alerted his hearing. And the Hammer and Cycle Messenger Service enabled our handshake deal over his mother. The narration is taken over by Mr. Trainer back in New York City. Hank set his own trap. Having lost out on certain social skills, he was completely over his head in business. His refusal to make good first impressions because that's the moment liars shine their best wasn't a springboard for success. Our acquaintance was due to his avoidance of other lawyers, while Dr. Hammer could only communicate with either of us through messages. None of us made time for the other. I was inconvenienced when Hank's plane ticket arrived at the office, making me two minutes late for a paired pianist concert at Lincoln Center that I had to wait for first intermission to enter. Because Mr. Greenway had held out for other last-minute financing, he called my home at the last minute asking if I still had his ticket. He pestered someone at the office for my home number. All we knew of each other was from his rude office visit, so I meant to destroy his ticket in the morning when his flight was scheduled. A little ceremony for Dr. Hammer's friend. Instead, I had to become his friend for a sense of compromise with accepting Hammer's small contributions. So, coming up my stairs that night, Hank worked on melting away my dissatisfaction. The same care that should have been applied to how business was done in the Soviet Union. Even then, before he'd left, his problems were in the air. He sounded oddly naive, curiously introspective, examining the street from my window. But he described the whole theory of how business evolved. Staring at the street, Hank said, Imagine the 19th century's hustling gangs, careening that little Franklin Alley shortcut to White Street. Shrewd entrepreneurs, incorporated from last century, and to this is some agreement probably born right down there from honor among thieves. Going straight for the money, so to speak. Incidents that stepped up the evolution of modern salesmanship's hustling, while up here with the same strategic calculating, sweatshop supervisors blocked the floor's only light, watching urchins underneath them squirt back and forth that short spurt. Because the men entertained a level of comfort, they could joke about the suspiciously hidden faces under tilted forward hats that wouldn't admit to seeing anything being taken over on Broadway. The smaller kids compelled to wear their caps with the same defiant pride and desperation's corruption. Mr. Trainer, a lot of action congested that alley in petty crime's heyday. Poverty we can solve, but criminal satisfaction is more troubling. Hank shrugged, sighed, and said, that alley was a grand thoroughfare before becoming your neighbor's parking lot. I can contemplate those cars' disappearance as our naval's central representation of this neighborhood's evolution from the Five Points era impoverishment. They're near here. Proud replacement 
fully square courthouses, our fine justice system carving out our malignant tumors, inspiring me to further wonder if living on Franklin Street works on wall. Are you really in on the head's resolutions or a mere satisfied limb executing the ruling elite's natural impulse to be effectively seen as erasing sin's desperate motivations? Judging our evaluated margins as what's out of control because, after all, law and order wasn't the criminal's idea or was it mob rule? Yes, that was something else Hank said that night staring out my window. I forgot till now, recalling his habit of speaking outrageously to push the line. Speaking of imagination, my legal work for Prodigy, one of the pre-World Wide Web Internet providers, is how I expose Hank to email. He loved letter writing's revival as a way of life, technology resuscitating with the phone previously crowded out of most of our lives. One evening, though, sensing spring stretched 1991's legs, I wasn't in the mood to turn my machine on. I ignored Hank's next urgent email asking if I'd clarify some loose end in Hammer's story. He supposedly didn't care, but loved hearing what any old timer came up with. But I'd convinced myself indoors was clouded over while outside was much more clean, clear, and pure. I rode my new bicycle wearing my new helmet, but somehow couldn't help but duplicate our old route from City Hall circles and the Woolworth Building's illumination to the Brooklyn Bridge. What a sight! There was no doubt up there that night Hank was right. We've almost progressed past pirates, robber barons, and bureaucratic straitjackets. I still felt F.W. Woolworth's pragmatic nickel-and-dime capitalism ruled the world. As Hank had said, today citizens own more means of production than ever before. The stock produce a dividend or doesn't it? Can everyone own stock or not? The class war should have outlived its use. It was easy from Greenway's mountaintop to appreciate his b belief efficient capitalism is socialism. By 1991, the Chinese were commanding their economy to be free, and the world was getting down to business. But on that same bench at the LaGuardia houses, I thought of what Hank wrote to me in December about the feuding economic contradictions that aren't quite as dead yet as recently deceased Dr. Hammer. Because the stage, the class war isn't just dying with any one death until all the Cold War's props are removed. He also, sitting on the bench, said, the economic partitions between classes could lift if we just see ourselves from the past's point of view. Understand how Prophet's logical straight line set the century out to become a corrupt utopia. Following history just north of here, little lucky Luciano streetwisely grew up within the sophisticated criminal enterprise system's shrewdness for opportunity. Surrounded by the poverty-stricken, the lucky tykes started in business feeding spoonfuls of laudanum to addicts lined prone along Delancey Street, cooperating individuals and an independent, connected businessman. Tact and ruthlessness is the formula for the criminal enterprise system. Every facet and element in our beautiful, brutal capitalism is for capitalizing on. So this world is really only as corrupt as it thought it had to be. Our system of justice drawn into retribution, substituting for solving crime. We hardly question stable government is justified drawing financial support from the enforcement of criminal enterprise. Because in a lazy way, we are smart about finance, 
not justice. Felonies and misdemeanors evolve hardened contestants. Trade morning to night, so lawyers have a piece of us all. Pardon me. Though I'd like to think the legal gentia cares if the world were more civilized, my dream is we'll find another way to make lawyers as much money as we think they have. Then wonder if we'll all be happier then. I asked Hank how much he thought I pulled in. He said, an actual figure doesn't matter. You don't make what the poor don't have. My belief is the problem is successful capitalism is positioned to surf inflation and has no incentive to solve finances corrosion that destroys the working poor. Inflation. And look how far out ahead your position is than those poor fooled, stripped Soviets. Now that was a crime. I said it's easy to sound an alarm, but inflation is reality. Hank said, I accept, but when the world figures itself out, there'll be no more use for your reality inflation. So I asked if he ever took an economics class. He said, a couple, enough to see the extra fittest survive extra better. That communist crap about receiving what you deserve. Hank, he said, debate is abstract, Mr. Trainer. There's always concealed positions not to concede. Then he put his foot on the bench to retie his shoe. Is the financial system's addiction to inflation the only way? Markets depend on fluctuation. But fluctuation from unstable money seems irresponsible. Why can't that be figured out? To contend money is not made from inflation is naive about a money handler's capabilities. Welcome to the circus, my friends. Yes, where ultimately Dr. Hammer is ruthless enough to be capitalist pure. But I want my money, not his. Did you hear? One of Dr. Hammer's law firms made serious money developing an advertising campaign I turned down. I wouldn't talk to anyone, but they kept the project going. Curiously, after six one night, I was messengering in their building and recognized the name. I snuck down a hall to a conference room and surprised a cleaning lady who ignored my looking at the display. The folio listed four lawyers who registered themselves as an ad agency. I remembered their names from the door. I bet they pulled six figures each from the old man. I felt bad. He put people on it right after he left my hospital room, and they put on a show for him. The print campaign was built around Dr. Hammer in front of the Hammer and Cycle office as you enter the Mesta Narodnaya lobby. For major newspapers, the two full-page centerfold spread was from behind Hammer's back of him looking at the Hammer and Cycle storefront mural as if he was in an art gallery. Hammer's caption read, I waited my whole life for this moment. Moment. I gagged. They could never reach me by phone and didn't really care. Quick in and out money. However, this business isn't vanity for me. That campaign could have gotten us a lot of crap to carry just so people could say they tried us. Mr. Trainer, don't look at me goofy. I know the reality of economics is attention. Money, a form of voting for what has your attention. I wouldn't sign anything. I wrote a note on the conference table telling them to use the name with my blessing. But now I have to go to Moscow. They couldn't find anyone really willing to try. A cousin of Yakov Smirnov used Hammer's money to fly to New York and he won't go back. I think he's in New Orleans. Hank laughed. <laughs> the name caught the old man's fancy and he couldn't let go. I think two years younger he'd do it himself. The one time we were on the phone and I confirmed I was sure I didn't want his money, it sounded like he actually hit the roof. The top of my head hurt. 
Of course, I'd have rather gone to Moscow last year, but I'm not stupid. It's a mess either way for me, and probably best if I rode out the gimmick and took his dough too. Except the hammer and cycle is an incredible image and obligation I feel I have to try to really make work. So when another ad agency called, I picked up my phone on the recording. They called the name a marketer's dream, and I was really hungry, so we did lunch on a Saturday. It's hard resisting the temptation to be entertained. They told me if I wanted, I could be the successful commercial puppet I'm trying to sidestep. You laugh. I know the point is to make money, but I also have to make a larger one. The Cold War's contrived trauma is too delusionally pure for the truth to slow us down. But we should get past political gurus gearing debate toward simplicity, frivolous accusations contorting conformed public opinion. Just because politics breeds a lot of money doesn't mean it's the truth. Speeches are just code-controlled social discourse to foment activated portions of the population. America's supposed liberal conservative political divide occurs, of course, because our conservative friends are right. Government private enterprise can be bad socialism. No kidding. Our most solidly valid dispute with Soviet socialism was their missing the boat on circulation, growth. Prosperous private armament capitalism destroyed the naive Soviet lack of having an actual economy. Then Hank spit. <coughs> My mother disapproved. I left the LaGuardia houses a little sore not yet riding every day. So I used tiredness as my excuse to be hungry by the time I reached the Mecca restaurant. Before crossing Houston, I scanned the intersection from the Essex side, and it occurred to me how the area's wide openness felt like a prairie clearing in the big city. Even as the manuscript finishes in its present 2013, that intersections buildings are still relatively low, unlike the rest of the city that doubled over by 2008's official economic crash. Don't get me wrong, I'm not confused New York grows for sound, prosperous reasons. It's just I prefer problems occurring in the least crowded way too. Like, and like Hank, I can also be impractical. But I don't accept that proletarian ideology meant you could live in the park. And independence realized is unproductive today. So I can't argue as the city becomes more customers, more stores, more work, more jobs, more. After decades of recovery from acute urban violence, today the metropolis is sharply dressed with just some corrosion underneath. It's now a decade since the Mecca restaurant finally closed. But when opened two decades ago, the night of my lone ride, the podium was unmanned and I was enticed by one of the two empty front window tables where I sat to patiently wait for a waitress. But I stood when I recognized Terry, hustling the center aisle toward me with a woman's smile that can really fry your mind apart. Smiling, she said, I'm sorry, a couple reserves this table, a special Wednesday tradition for all of us. I felt glad I'd gotten up, because nothing is worse than being made to understand while talked down to in a chair, feeling flushed as if fired. I said, of course, I don't have a reservation. She said, you're taking credit for having a clue. Then she pulled out my next chair and brought up that we'd seen each other before. I'd hoped she wouldn't remember, thinking it might be interesting as a fly on the wall. But Terry said, you can see outside from here. Hank is big on views. You probably are too.
I said, opinions not as large as his, and that began our first laugh together at Greenway's expense. Then I was gone lost in the captivating painting on the wall of lions and all, staring in wide-eyed wonder at Daniel with his back to me in their den. Then the menu in my hand brought me smoothly back. Terry said, I don't know if Hank told you. My name is Terry. We're happy to have you here. What would you like to drink? I said, just water and I'm glad we've now been properly introduced. You wouldn't know my name either, Phil Trainer, Not Philip? I prefer Phil, and please don't call me Mr. Trainer. Mr. Greenway ignores my preference. Sure, Phil. Contrary to Hank is encouraged here. Then a few more of my cells were fried by Terry's smile from spotting the couple coming to the door. She pulled out their chairs, and they didn't receive menus, and all three thanked their waiter for the crackers, bread, and even salads that arrived when the couple sat, reinforcing my belief in the efficiency a commercial exchange achieves. But then instinctively, Terry locked her eyes on an approaching storm coming from the kitchen, as if fire really protruded from the eyes of Hank's nemesis. Very uncommon for an owner to allow their whole restaurant to be made into a scene, even or especially if imposing domination over their domain, though that's a well-regarded management style one has to respect or get another job. Terry's defiant, calm, not here, stopped him, and he followed her to the back. But before he made it, the abnormal quiet friction ignited another explosion, and the boyfriend yelled, I don't care, as if whoever owned the place would have to kick him out if it wasn't obviously already his. The beauty of personal property is free expressions, repercussions. So then maybe, considering consequences are a factor, the restaurant's owner seemed to calm, but his bitter voice couldn't making his growl, I don't want him here, sound meaner than necessary when he could have just as well yelled as he did again. We talked about this. She still, nonetheless, faced down his anger in an uncommonly tranquil way. Talk? You're always telling me. How dare you? Sports nut. Now I can see last night's seduction was just your mouth dribbling to the basket. Devotion, love, you cherish, George, but you don't appreciate. Then she turned. Still following, he tried. Terry, in an almost normal voice, so she stopped. Then he, perhaps, purposely bumped into her, pleading, what does this mean? And he wanted her to look in his eyes as he said, our warmth wasn't just my creation, you know that. And she flipped back her head. I'll ignore your trying to plant more thoughts in me. Come on, be honest. Admit you corral your possessions, cowboy. The restaurateur acted confused. But we care for each other. What happened? Then, while his head drooped, seeking pity, her body went limp as if he hit it in the gut when she saw his gaze straight at me filled with hate. So she offered what little was left. Caring, George, is enough of a reason to disregard nonsense. But who attaches to that? Memories can't always replace new facts. This man and Hank have been nothing but polite, while you're always rude. He lost it and yelled, Stop repeating that name! She answered, thanks for asking, but then saw his same clenched fist hitting his thigh that I saw in Hank's face the last time. Then breaking the silence, his words slugged nearly the same as his fist could. His name from your kisser, Terry, is like the jerk is in front of me now. I'm not his doormat, but she was angry too. That's it. Nice knowing you. 
Then to me she said, we're thrown out and stepped between us so I couldn't be reached.